Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Eikhoff, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Alumni Relations at John Carroll University. Thank you for joining us this evening for our next installment of ACES, the Alumni Continuing Education Series. ACES was established in the spring of 2013 by the Office of Alumni Relations in the spirit of lifelong learning. The program offers enrichment opportunities for our alumni and friends through the expertise of members of the JCU administration, faculty, and our alumni community. As a result of COVID-19 and our inability to connect with all of you in person, we've moved our programming online. Over the past year, we've heard from experts on ethics and leadership, recent advances in autism research, youth sports, social justice, disruptive technology, space exploration, and the women's suffrage movement, just to name a few. Tonight, we will focus on Larry Doby and his baseball legacy. Before I introduce John McMurray, I want to share a few housekeeping items. First, please ensure that you stay muted throughout the duration of the program, utilizing the chat feature for any questions you may have. We will ask them towards the end of our program. Additionally, I encourage you to view the program in full screen mode. Uh, and when, and when uh, Mr. McMurray shares his PowerPoint, I recommend that you adjust the size of the windows. To do that, hover your cursor between the PowerPoint and the window with Mr. McMurray. A vertical line should appear. Adjust the bar so the screen is split evenly. If it doesn't work for you, that's quite okay. It won't ruin your experience this evening. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker. Since 2007, John McMurray has chaired the Deadball Era Committee of the Society for American Baseball Research, better known as SABRE, which closely examines all aspects of the game from 1901 through 1919. This work includes considering baseball as we know it, how it came to be, and how the game of the past informs the game today. He also chairs the Oral History Committee for Sabre, which maintains the largest collection of interviews with figures of the game outside of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Over nearly 30 years, he has interviewed scores of players from those with Hall of Fame re resumes like Greg Maddox and Bob Feller to those dedicated baseball fans would know like Harry Eisentat and Nelson Bryles. As an undergraduate at Princeton University, some of his policy work in their School of Public and International Affairs, including study, studying baseball economics and labor relations under the direction of Paul Volcker, former chairman of the Federal Reserve. His own research has covered a range of topics from the benefit game honoring former Cleveland pitcher Addie Joss to scrutinizing Babe Ruth's role as a coach with the 1938 Brooklyn Dodgers to examining the life and work of Lawrence Ritter whose interviews with baseball pioneers are the foundation of oral, of oral history in the sport. He also lectured twice at Smithsonian Associates programs at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, covering how baseball became modern in the 1920s and a history of the World Series since 1903. At JCU, uh, Mr. McMurray has taught three courses of, on sports, which often include discussions with figures across the sporting landscape. Please join me in welcoming John McMurray. John, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, and, uh, and for, for having me and for considering this um, important and interesting topic. Uh, the story of Larry Doby is unique, both in uh, baseball lore and in Cleveland sports history. Uh, Doby is known as the player who integrated baseball's American League in 1947 when the league's unofficial uh, but very rigid color barrier was broken. Doby joined the Indians directly from the Newark Eagles of uh, the Negro Leagues, and he made his debut on July the 5th, 1947. But in addition to his groundbreaking uh, uh, recognition, uh, Doby is also one of the most decorated players of baseball's 1950s. He was a seven-time All-Star. He led the American League in home runs twice and, run, and in runs battered in once. Uh, he was an indispensable figure on two World Series teams in Cleveland, and he was an excellent defensive player. Overall, Doby was a player so good that he would become the fifth Indian player to, uh, to have his number retired on July the 3rd, 1994. He joined Earl Averill, Lou Boudreau, Bob Feller, and Mel Harder and he would eventually be get elected to baseball's Hall of Fame. Yet for all of Doby's accomplishment, he remains what uh, was once applied to Addie Joss uh, and is called a shadowy figure in clear light. 
Dobie is rarely seen as an individual standing on his own merits. Either he shares a spotlight with Jackie Robinson, uh, uh, the first player to break baseball's color barrier in the modern era just 81 days prior. Or he's very much a secondary figure in the narrative. There's even a book about Doby called Greatness in the Shadows. Now, Joseph Paul Moore, in the seminal biography of Doby titled Pride Against Prejudice, argues in the very first line of the book's preface that the only right way to consider Doby is alongside Jackie Robinson. And with respect to Doby, there's no other figure in sports whose legacy is so deeply interwoven with another player, and especially one that he never played against in the regular season. And for all of the celebration, love, and admiration that Jackie Robinson inspires as a trailblazer year after year, the response to Doby's career is comparatively muted. There's a Larry Doby day uh, most of the time on the anniversary of his debut, but it's not close uh, to inspiring league-wide celebration. And it's not even of much consequence locally here in Cleveland. There are few calls to retire his number nationwide or league-wide, uh, but you hear them from time to time. And commemorations of Larry Doby's legacy are scant. If Jackie Robinson is loved, uh, Larry Doby is respected and at a distance of that. So keep in mind that while Doby was the second African-American player in the major leagues, he was the first in his own league. Uh, the two leagues didn't play each other until 1997. They operated on completely parallel tracks. Uh, they met only in the World Series. American League teams played American League teams. National League teams played National League teams all season long, meeting only in the World Series or in the All-Star game. So as the first African-American player in his own league, Doby really did break a barrier. Even so, Faye Vincent, the former commissioner of baseball, said that Doby's like Buzz Aldrin, uh, the second man to set foot on the moon. Many analogies about Doby relate to being like the vice president, someone who's prominent, but not necessarily in the direct spotlight. And even the Baseball Hall of Fame website says in its opening description, perhaps no one is remembered more for being second than Larry Doby. Yet Doby is just as much the Jackie Robinson of baseball's American League. Uh, and he, they went down a remarkably similar path and received many of the same, if not most of the same, indignities. Now, Robinson and Doby do have different career arcs. Robinson was an almost overnight sensation. Doby got there incrementally. Robinson was the National League Rookie of the Year in 1947, and he played in the World Series the same year. Robinson was elected to the Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility. Doby, though, had a slower start. And he had to wait 51 years to get into the Hall of Fame after his debut. Robinson was playing in New York at the center of baseball's universe. And Doby was on the other end. He was in Cleveland on a planet orbiting the sun, at least in baseball terms. And then he spent time in relative obscurity with the White Sox and Tigers. Robinson was a tough act to follow. Uh, but Doby did it with grace and humility and achievement. Now, even with these contrasts to Jackie Robinson, Doby's early impact resonates today through a photo. Now, in 1948, Doby's second season, he showed some signs of being a star. Lou Boudreau and Joe Gordon were the leaders of the team. Both of them were eventually Hall of Fame players themselves. Boudreau played at short, Gordon played at second. But Doby's 14 home runs and 66 runs batted in while batting 301 in 1948 was more than respectable. The team would win 97 regular season games and it would get to the World Series for the first time since 1920. Now in that World Series, uh, Cleveland played the Boston Braves and the turning point in game four of the World Series uh, in Cleveland's Municipal Stadium, Doby would hit a home run uh, to right field off of Boston's uh, star pitcher, Johnny Sane. And although it was hit in the third inning, uh, the run was the last one of the game in a two to one Cleveland win. Now, Steve Gromek, one of Cleveland's pitchers, uh, pitched a complete game for the win that day. 
And Doby's home run was especially consequential because it propelled Cleveland to win one win of the World Series title. And it also was the first home run hit in World Series history uh, by an African-American player. Uh, it's, uh, it's all certain that the home run was the turning point in the entire series. Now, following the game in the Cleveland locker room, uh, the, uh, Gromack and Doby were photographed together cheek to cheek. And you can't overstate how groundbreaking this photo was at the time. The Cleveland Plain Dealer printed this image on its front page the next day. It showed euphoria, camaraderie, and acceptance between two players of, uh, and two teammates of different races. Doby described it as completely spontaneous, as he said, as I say, God works in mysterious ways. Here's a white guy and an Afro-American guy who are put together to win a game. And when it's over, they don't wonder, should I not do this because I'm white and he's black? Or because I'm black and he's white? No, they just do it. They just hug each other because they're happy, which made up for everything I went through. I would always relate back to that whenever I was insulted or rejected by hotels. I'd always think back to that picture of Gromek and me it would take away all the negatives. Now, baseball's slow and modest integration process was less than two years in at that time. When Doby hit the home run, there were only seven African-American players in baseball. There was Doby, Jackie Robinson, Dan Bankhead, and Roy Campanella, who played with the Dodgers. Uh, there were Hank Thompson and Willard Brown with the St. Louis Browns. And then there was Satchel Paige, Doby's uh, teammate with Cleveland. At the time, scenes with African-American players in the sports lore were, simple, were few. And the photo with Gromek inspired a bit of an earthquake, both locally and nationwide. Now, in general, baseball photos tend to endure in the public consciousness. And maybe that's just part of the sports fabric. You think about Babe Ruth, who was stood uh, when he was dying of cancer and on Babe Ruth Day in Yankee Stadium and propped himself up on a bat, and how that image has resonated for more than 60 years. Or Lou Gehrig when he was giving his uh, luckiest man on the face of the earth speech in 1939. There's a famous photo of Ty Cobb sliding into third base in 1909 and raising the dust that also endures a century later. Now here, the photo symbolized the change in the sports ethos. It conveyed acceptance of Doby as a teammate. Just a year prior, Doby had to go into the visiting clubhouse in Chicago to borrow a first baseman's mitt uh, since none of his teammates would offer him one on the first time he ever started in the field. There was also an earlier photo uh, of Robinson shaking hands with George Shuba with the Montreal Royals in 1946. This is the first known photo of black and white players congratulating each other on the baseball diamond. But this photo that you see here was on the minor league level and the Shuba photo conveyed professionalism and a formal remove, more so than emotional acceptance, as you saw in the, Groby, in the Gromack and Doby photo. Now, after the photo with Doby in 1948, Steve Gromack received backlash at home in Michigan in the off season. One friend that he saw initially ignored Gromack because of the photo, and then he opined that Gromack should just have shaken Doby's hand instead of that cheek to cheek pose. Doby eventually said, the picture was more rewarding for me than actually hitting the home run. Now the photo that you saw um, a few minutes ago of Gromek and Doby was a centerpiece of both, both of their obituaries in the New York Times. Uh, as you see here, Gromek's obituary had the headline, uh, Steve Gromek 82, a picture best known for a picture. The obituary itself said that the photo was quote, a signature moment in the integration of Major League Baseball. The American League, Doby's League, was much slower to integrate. Uh, and baseball didn't even have 10 new African-American players in a season until 1954. There was always just a handful uh, coming in each year. And, and the Yankees didn't integrate until 1955, a full eight years after Brooklyn and Cleveland. Detroit, not until 1958. And the Red Sox, the last team to integrate, didn't do so until 1959. In the mid-1960s, the balance of power in baseball would shift. Teams that are integrated would become dominant by mid-decade, 
and those that didn't were no longer at the center of baseball success. Now, photos of players of different races uh, and ethnicities together is commonplace. A uh, photo from just a couple of years ago. Uh, there's, uh, the Gromek and Doby photo, which is to a degree the model for the one you see here, uh, there's no other baseball photo of the time which comes close to the level of intimacy and acceptance between players of different races. Doby played 13 seasons in the major leagues from 1947 through 1959. He was born on December the 13th, uh, 1923 in Camden, South Carolina. And fortuitously, uh, Larry's father, David, met Larry's mother, Etta, uh, while playing baseball in front of her home. Larry's father was a stable hand and he died when Larry was only eight. He drowned while fishing and Larry and his mother ultimately relocated to Patterson, New Jersey. In school, Larry wanted to emulate his father who was a semi-pro ball player. And Larry played sandlot ball close to home. Larry lettered in baseball at Patterson East Side High School. And he, learned a, he earned 11 letters in sports during high school, including in track and basketball. And even then, Larry began playing under an assumed name, Larry Walker in the Negro Leagues for the Newark Eagles at age 17. Uh, the evidence suggests that he did that in order to protect his amateur status than because of discrimination. He, went, he enrolled at Long Island University on a basketball scholarship, hoping to play under renowned basketball coach Claire B. But there wasn't a spot on the team and he transferred to Virginia Union College to play where he hoped to enter an ROTC program. And then Doby got drafted into the Navy. And when he got into the military, the segregated ways there left deep impressions. But he was able to play on the baseball team at Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Chicago, where Bill Veck, the owner of the Cleveland Indians, spotted him. Now, Doby had thought of becoming a teacher or a coach when he was discharged. But his career path changed when Jackie Robinson was signed in 1945 to a contract to play baseball in Montreal. My main thing, said Doby, was to become a teacher and a coach. But when I heard about Jackie, I decided to concentrate on baseball and I forgot about going back to college. Now, previously with the Newark Eagles, Doby had gotten to know Monty Irvin, another player who became a baseball hall of famer in time. And Irvin provided the entree for Doby to rejoin the Eagles after his military service. And it also put him in a good position to date his wife who was local. The Newark Eagles won the Negro Leagues World Series with Doby as a catalyst in 1946. And coincidentally, that series was against the Kansas City Monarchs who had Satchel Paige. And this is a, a slide showing the um, a little about the uh, Negro League World Series that year. Now, Page helped to make um, the Kansas City Monarchs one of the dominant teams in the Negro Leagues. And success in that World Series against Page uh, and Kansas City convinced Doby that his talent was enough to succeed at the highest levels. And it was enough to um, attract the attention of Bill Veck, the owner of the Indians, into signing Doby to a, a contract. Veck had long had a desire to integrate the league, and he had planned to integrate uh, baseball's American League in secret. And he signed Doby under the radar to begin play in 1947, just after the All-Star break. The All-Star game was to be held on July 8th. He was going to bring Doby to the major leagues on July the 10th. But a scoop from a reporter that Vec was actually going to bring Doby to the major leagues, forced Vec's hand, and it made him uh, debut Doby earlier than he would have otherwise on July the 5th. Uh, Doby wound up making his debut on the road in Chicago, um, and Doby would strike out in his first major league at bat uh, against the White Sox as a pinch hitter. So as we think about these moments in retrospect, the day that Larry Doby broke the color barrier as being transcendent, um, Doby in fact had a pedestrian late game pinch hitting appearance. He got his first hit and his first run batted in uh, in the next game. But his first season was hardly the stuff of budding stardom. 
In fact, Doby started one of 29 games that he played that season. He struck out 11 times in 32 at bats. And he finished the season with a very pedestrian 156 batting average. Even Vec, in his own autobiography, said that Vec, that, that Doby in his first season could be considered a bust. Keep in mind, too, that Doby was learning a new position. He was playing the outfield for the first time. Doby in the minor leagues had played at second base but he, and a little bit of shortstop. But he, with uh, Boudreaux and Gordon playing in Cleveland, Doby wasn't going to have any long-term future there. So he wound up going into the outfield, and he lacked the defensive polish that he would later develop. And acceptance, too, was hard to come by. Um, Doby described his arrival with the team as tough, and he said he was, quote, embarrassed by the lack of welcome that he received. Now, Doby did not name the players who treated him poorly. He did believe that he endured the same level of taunts and slur slurs as Jackie Robinson did. Lou Brissy, who played for the uh, Philadelphia Athletics, noted that teammates would shout things at Doby like, Porter, carry my bags, or shoe shine boy, shine my shoes, and worse. Doby said later on that four or six of his Cleveland teammates when he first came into the locker room wouldn't shake his hand. Now, esteemed Cleveland sports reporter Russell Snyder said that Doby slid into a base and an opposing player whom Doby never identified spat tobacco juice in Doby's face. And Doby said he wanted to beat the opposing player up, but, quote, I knew I shouldn't I, and I couldn't. Even the team's hotel in Tucson, where they trained in the Springs, wasn't integrated until Doby had played seven years on the major leagues. As Doby once reflected, it's not good when everyone is together on the team and he had to leave when the game was over. Doby said, quote, I had to be careful how I reacted to anything. I couldn't argue, not even to look at an umpire who called what I might believe was a questionable strike. There could be no fighting, absolutely no fighting. And I was told by Vec it would be best if I didn't sign any autographs for Caucasian women over 15, because it might look like I was trying to get a phone number. Vec told Doby that all of this was the price for being a part of baseball history. Only once, Doby recalled, did he try and go after a heckling fan in the stands in St. Louis, where the riding was especially hard, but his teammates stopped him. Overall, Doby said that the treatment was the hardest on his wife uh, because she was in the seats and she had to hear the various uh, slurs and threats uh, from, uh, at close range. It was also hard for his five young children who just didn't understand what was going on. And Doby was very keen on not mentioning which players treated him poorly, but he did give credit to those who treated him well. And Joe Gordon, the team's second baseman, was at the top of the list. Doby also said that Jim Hegan, the team's catcher, Bob Lemon, a pitcher, and a coach, Bill McKechnie, uh, shook his hand when uh, manager Lou Boudreau brought him around. Joe Morgan, the Hall of Fame second baseman who's been on ESPN for a long time, uh, said that uh, Gordon playing catch with Doby early on was a sign of acceptance. It signaled to his other teammates to join in. And Doby's teammates had largely ignored him when he went out to the field for the first time. It is perhaps because Doby kept so much to himself that fans didn't appreciate enough what he had to endure and how he overcame it. Doby said, I was looked on as a black man, not as a human being. I did feel a responsibility to the black players who came after me, but that was a responsibility basically to people, not just to black people. There's also the issue of Doby's personality. When cast against Robinson in perpetuity, the differences become apparent. Both did not fight back in the face of racial animus by design, but Robinson was a vocal leader. He was a dynamo whose electric, aggressive playing style symbolized a presence that no contemporaries or fans could ignore. Robinson, who stole home 20 times, lent his own style to a sport enraptured with the home run. Robinson changed the style of play. There are frequent photos of him rounding first base with verve. The enduring image of Robinson is of him rounding the bag. Uh, he had to be accounted for on the base paths at all times. 
Also, Jackie Robinson vocally championed causes in the political arena, speaking out for equity in the sport. In his last appearance uh, in the 1972 World Series, Robinson pressured the sport to hire an African-American manager, which they did not had up to that point. And Robinson's gravesite has a prominent quote in a social context, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Robinson was active, engaged. He was at the center of it all. His name and persona became and have remained a proxy for a set of values. But Dobie had no such vocal presence. Even his quotes are few. His relative stoicism is summed up by the quote, I had to take it. I responded by hitting the ball as far as I could. That was my answer. Now Robinson could channel his anger into heightened on-field performance. And Dobie too reportedly had a temper. But Don Newcomb, the Brooklyn Dodger pitcher, and one of Dobie's best friends said that Dobie uh, simply couldn't harness his temper to performance. And Dobie said, I could have fought every day if I'd wanted to, but that he had to exhibit restraint. But Dobie's reticence, I think, comes at a bit of a reputational cost. He did not command the attention that Robinson did. Dobie was also hindered by playing outside the media spotlight of New York. Robinson's first few years received extensive coverage with the uh, Pittsburgh Courier and the Baltimore Afro-American, two African-American newspapers. But Dobie received comparatively little coverage. And through no fault of his own, Dobie did not redefine the game style of play. Rather than shattering convention, Dobie was a power hitter in a league known for power hitters. On the other hand, Robinson aspired, at least stylistically, um, other torrid base dealers, Willie Mays, Maury Wills, Lou Brock, Ricky Henderson. The aggressive play of the 1970s was an outgrowth of Jackie Robinson in many ways, thus embedding Robinson more deeply in the game. And good as he was, Dobie was not the same caliber of slugger as Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, and Ted Williams were. Dobie was consistent. He had seven straight all-star appearances. He had 10 straight seasons of 14 home runs and 50 runs batted in. He had a top 10 finish in the most valuable player award voting uh, every year from 1950 through 1954. Um, and Dobie finished second to Yogi Berra in the 1954 American League MVP voting, but he never won it. Robinson did in his second season. Robinson was a player you couldn't turn away from. He had six World Series over a decade in Brooklyn. He was a player, as Fangraf said, who had no weaknesses. Whereas Dobie stayed within the same architect, archetype. And it was a really good archetype. Uh, and it was an exceptional level of performance too. So as his playing prominence grew, uh, so did Dobie's uh, public profile. He became the, among the first players to have an endorsement. Uh, first African-American players with an endorsement, a sure sign of having made it. Now in Cleveland, uh, Dobie was also in the shadow of teammate Satchel Page. One writer called Page a storehouse of kinetic energy. Uh, Page had an exaggerated left leg kick. He had a full body motion. One writer called it a catapult as he threw the ball. He was the ultimate drawing card in baseball's Negro Leagues. And Page was also a comedian and a performer, which sometimes rubbed Dobie the wrong way. Dobie said, quote, I didn't like when guys laughed at Satch's stories because I knew they were also laughing at Satch as a black man. So Satch and I didn't spend much time together. Dobie said rather curtly in a subsequent interview that Page's presence, quote, had no influence over me, none at all. Page brought a new vigor to the league, which had been traditionally understated. He had flair and grace and hoopla. Page set records on the field and with longevity, which led to him becoming the first vintage Negro leaguer to enter the Hall of Fame. There's a picture of Dobie looking over Page's shoulder. Uh, Page, like Robinson, but for different reasons, was hard to ignore. And fans loved the ease with which they felt they knew their star pitcher. Page's joking demeanor though, clash with Dobie's somber seriousness. Said Moore, quote, Dobie was almost the opposite of Page in terms of personality. Dobie was a shy and subdued man. 
Page was not. Page attracted great attention while Dobie avoided it. Page and Robinson kept the spotlight almost entirely on themselves, said Moore. Dobie, using a different method of coping, stood in a dimmer light away from center stage. And because of Dobie's self-effacing nature, I met him briefly in the late 1980s and can attest to it, Dobie can be a hard person to know. And in sports, personality can in part be destiny. Often the most renowned players from Babe Ruth to Ken Griffey Jr. stand out in part because of their overflowing personality. But reticent players like Dobie recede a little bit in the historical memory. Even someone like Stan Musial, uh, the St. Louis outfielder, as good as he was, is less known and therefore less recognized. Robinson's star shone so brightly that Dobie can pale, relatively speaking, as bright as Dobie's star happens to be. It's worth noting that Dobie and Jackie Robinson were friends. Uh, the photos of the two together abound, and Dobie frequently expressed his admiration for Jackie Robinson. Uh, the two were in touch often. Uh, they were not competitors as much as co-supporters on a parallel track. Um, Effa Manley, the tempestuous co-owner of the Newark Eagles, at one point attempted to inspire some rivalry and said that Robinson can't carry Dobie's glove. But you never hear those competitive comments between Dobie and Robinson themselves. Also, Robinson, by playing in the minor leagues, had the chance to travel around and get a sense of the sport's racial climate for a few years. Dobie, who came straight from the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues, had no such luxury. Uh, coming to the big leagues for Dobie uh, was much more of a jolt, said uh, baseball writer Daniel Okren. Uh, quote, Robinson had a two-year drum roll. Dobie just showed up. Um, Bill Veck had told the Pittsburgh Courier that, he, that someday he would just uh, debut an, an African-American player uh, as a surprise and he'll just, uh, it will just be out there. And in retrospect, Vex said that he moved slowly and carefully with Doby and perhaps even timidly seeming to express some regret the way that he threw Doby into the middle of things. Now, Doby often cited Jackie Robinson as a source of support and he attended Jackie Robinson's funeral too. Now, Doby's achievements go beyond what he did in 1947 and 48. Um, he had a 21 game hitting streak in 1951. On uh, June the 4th of 1952, Dobie hit for the cycle, uh, a rare feat. And he also robbed a home run and a game saving grab over the fence that year. And more essentially, Dobie was surely uh, the team's best player on the 1954 team that went to the World Series. His, 19, his, his uh, 32 home runs and 126 runs battered in led the American League. Um, in 1954, he became the first African-American player to hit a home run in the All-Star game. He pinch hit a solo shot in the, at the game in Cleveland and tied the game at nine. Um, and after a strong 1954 and 55 season, uh, although his numbers were declining a bit in 55, um, Dobie, who didn't get to the majors until age 24, he suffered from concerns about his age and a bit about uh, with respect to durability. He had had a muscle tear in his thigh. He'd had an ankle problem. And he was chosen as an all-star in 1955, but he couldn't play uh, due to leg problems. And so Cleveland wound up trading him to the Chicago White Sox. And Hank Greenberg, the team's general manager, traded him some prospects, the most notable of whom is Chico Carrasquel. And Dobie's productivity at that point never returned to where it had been. His 1956 season was the beginning of a, of a pretty steady decline. And with his stature as an everyday player waning, and it's worth noting that he did lead the White Sox in home runs his first year there with 24, but he was traded three more times over two seasons to the Orioles in a deal involving Tito Francona in 1957, though he never played in Baltimore. And then he was traded back to Cleveland in 1958. And then he was traded again to the Detroit Tigers in a deal also involving Tito Francona again, making him the only player involved in trades for Terry Francona's father twice. And only a couple of months later, he was purchased by the Chicago White Sox, thus ending one of the great player movements in uh, modern history. He would briefly join his uh, friend Don Newcomb 
1961, as the two became the first former major leaguers to play in Japan, which he did briefly and with minimal success. Doby really wasn't an everyday player after 1956. And his on-field highlights were 1952 and 1954. His peak was from 1949 to 1955, which is a relatively small window. So Doby retired uh, and he worked for a, a while in the liquor sales business and he became a scout with the Montreal Expos uh, and eventually a coach too. He did instructional work with the team. But he soon got word uh, that the Cleveland Indians were thinking about hiring an African-American manager. And so he moved over to the team uh, in uh, 1972. Uh, and he joined the team as a first base coach. And he turned out uh, to be on the, the team staff when Frank Robinson became the first African-American manager. And Doby had been in prime position. No one had promised him anything, but he had reason to think that he was in contention to become the first African-American manager. And once again, Doby wound up being second. Uh, he, uh, instead, he was hired uh, in the 1978 season to be manager of the Chicago White Sox um, when the team struggled. He became the second African-American manager overall. And who was the person who hired him? Bill Veck, the same person who brought him to Cleveland in 1947, by then owned the White Sox and gave Doby the first opportunity to manage. But Doby wasn't given much of an opportunity. Uh, he, uh, Bob Lemon, the Hall of Fame pitcher, had started as the team manager in 1978, and they were a pedestrian 34 and 40. And, and Doby took over in midseason and went the rest of the way. Uh, the team went 37 and 50 uh, and finished in fifth place. And Doby ultimately um, uh, was, was fired from that position and reassigned and went back to being the team's batting coach, which he had been previously. And it was a bit of a shock. Doby said um, in retrospect that he really wasn't given much of an opportunity to succeed. And he was never given the chance to manage on the big league level again. Um, in an odd twist, because of his New Jersey ties, Doby uh, uh, became director of communications with the uh, New Jersey Nets of the National Basketball Association in the early 1980s. And ultimately, he took on various positions in the league, uh, Major League Baseball's league office, including being an assistant to American League President uh, Gene Budick. So a lot of people ask about Doby's um, quest for the Hall of Fame, which was slow and arduous. I mentioned earlier that it took Doby 51 years after his debut uh, to enter baseball's Hall of Fame. Um, in particular, many people ask, why did Jackie Robinson, uh, who was elected in his first year of eligibility in 1962 with 77.5% of the vote, uh, and Doby had to wait uh, three years, uh, had, had to wait um, I'm sorry, uh, three decades after he was first eligible. Uh, certainly there's a real incongruity in the numbers. I'll give you three reasons why it took so long for Doby to make it into the Hall of Fame. The first I've alluded to, that Jackie Robinson was simply a singular talent. And because of his great initial success and platform in New York, Robinson's entry was undeniable. Robinson was a rookie of the year and MVP, Doby was not. Robinson stood out and Doby blended in. But a second is also a, a bit a, um, a question of context. Um, Doby's career stands out when taken into context, but it doesn't necessarily when you just look at the numbers. Doby finished his career with 253 home runs and a 283 batting average. Solid, but not transcendent by Hall of Fame standards. And the players whose batting numbers compare, compare most closely uh, none in the top 10 are in the Hall of Fame. Players you might know, such as J.D. Drew or David Justice or Eric Davis and Ray Lankford. Uh, Doby also had relatively few milestones. He led the league in home runs twice, RBIs once, runs scored once, and he had a relatively short peak. And it makes his career more open to interpretation. But if you look at raw data over impact, Doby can be easy to dismiss, but he has been rehabilitated a bit by advanced metrics. One such statistic is called OPS plus, uh, namely on-base percentage plus slugging percentage, which is normalized across the entire league. And it produces a composite number so that players are easy to compare. 100 is average. If you're 101, uh, then you're 1% above average and so forth. 
Um, and Dobie was in the top 10 in that category every year from 1948 through 1953. And he led the league in OPS plus in 1950 and 1952, but only twice in spite of being in the top 10 in OPS from 48 to 53 uh, did, was Dobie in the top 10 in MVP voting. The bottom line is that this, this advanced metric suggests that Dobie was undervalued. A third reason why Dobie didn't get into the Hall of Fame until a lot later was simply the Hall of Fame's very unusual procedures, which can be hard to explain even now. I consulted with Jay Jaffe, who's an expert on the Hall of Fame, uh, and he's convinced that Dobie got the short end of the stick in the process. First of all, there was no Hall of Fame voting in 1965 when Dobie first came uh, eligible. Uh, the Hall of Fame at that point was voting every other year from 1956 through 1966. And Ultimately, his vote totals were sub meager, as you see, in 66 and 67. And when that happened, Dobie just fell off the radar. In Bill James' seminal book, Whatever Happened to the Hall of Fame, Dobie gets only a passing mention and no serious analysis. He just wasn't thought of as a Hall of Famer. And sometimes that happens to people. Burt Blylevin is another example. And in time, he was elected. And the Hall of Fame also had a lot of politics and cronyism and players getting in because of their friends and so forth. And there may have also been an effort to keep the hall small and rarefied. Now, normally Dobie would have been considered by what was then called the Veterans Committee and, can, and brought back to the ballot in 1980, uh, but he wasn't. And no one I've spoken to has a good reason why. Jaffe said that his removal from the ballot appears to have been arbitrary. And Hall of Fame voting has never been consistent or standardized. And the Hall of Fame, in some cases, put it together as, as, as they went. Um, and it tends to move uh, a little bit according to the tides. Now, in 1966, Ted Williams, in his Hall of Fame speech, uh, lobbied baseball to consider prominent Negro League players. He mentioned Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson by name. And Bowie Kuhn, who was then commissioner of baseball, convened a panel to do it. But the debate had pretty steep divisions. Some people wanted it, some people didn't, and Kuhn compromised. And he commissioned a display of Negro League greats at the Hall of Fame, but separate from the regular museum announced in 1971. And he commissioned a select panel of players and uh, former players and writers to figure out who should get into that, what James called a separate and almost equal sort of display. And Commissioner Kuhn uh, may have, uh, who, who wanted to integrate Negro League players into the Hall of Fame, may have been trying to shine light on an issue, but it also um, brought attention to the Hall of Fame's uh, ex exclusionary practices. Uh, so the Special Committee on the Negro League selected 10 players over the course of the 1970s. Robinson and Roy Campanella made it in by the writers, and then a whole bunch of Negro League players, Page, Gibson, Monty Irvin, Cool Papa Bell, Oscar Charleston among them, all came in by this committee in the 1970s. And it's hard to say for sure, but there's a sense that the Hall of Fame felt it may have just done enough by that point, and Dobie slipped between the cracks. After all, he had only one year in the Negro Leagues, or he had a couple of years in the Negro Leagues, but not an extended career. Um, and so while the panel was recognizing a group of established Negro League players, uh, Dobie may have fallen by the wayside. And as I say, the Hall of Fame voting has always been a fickle process, but Jaffe had said that the neglect with which Dobie was treated was one of the Hall of Fame's darkest chapters. And there's also the question of what we want the Hall to be. Um, at times, Hall of Fame voters have been concerned with the metrics, the measurables, uh, but it also has contributors. And Dobie, in, to a degree, had really good numbers and was also a contributor, but to a degree, the Hall of Fame didn't quite know what to do with them, I think, and which led to his exceptional and, and odd three-decade wait. Now, Dobie was elected by the Hall of Fame's Veterans Committee in 1998, missing the 50th anniversary of his debut by a year. With, but momentum had started to increase by that point. He was the fifth Indian selected, preceded by Lou Boudreau, Bob Feller, Bob Lemon, and Page, and then there's also Bill Beck as, as team owner. And many also suggest, by the way, as you see Dobie's plaque, uh, that understatement in Hall of Fame plaques is something that needs to be amended, maybe something that's a little bit less matter of fact. As you'll note here, there are a, a number of 
instances uh, chronicling what Dobie did on the field, but his social significance is, is, is near the bottom. And Jackie Robinson's plaque was amended. The first one made no note of his social significance. It just lauded his playing accomplishments. And they had a new one in 2008 that said he displayed tremendous courage and poise in 1947 when he integrated the major leagues in the, fence, in the face of intense adversity. And maybe Dobie deserves the same kind of revision. Now, Dobie died of cancer in 2003. He was age 79, and he received accolades while he was living. His uniform number was retired by the Cleveland Indians, his number 14. Um, and uh, that was also the fifth in team history. And he threw out the first pitch at the All-Star Game in 1997. Um, held in Cleveland. And his statue was unveiled uh, after his death in 2015 outside uh, Progressive Field. Uh, the Ohio Sculpture Center said that Dobie's look, as you see here, is determined and focused as he leans toward first base, ready to spring off in a moment's notice. Uh, but there also was some controversy with the statue. Some feel that Dobie should have had a statue before Jim Tomey had one in 2014. There's also Larry Dobie Way outside Progressive Field. And keep in mind that the Larry Dobie statue at Pro Progressive Field, um, there was actually one in Patterson, New Jersey, which came first. Um, and that was unveiled in uh, January of 2002. Now, Dobie's son, Larry Dobie Jr., uh, said that Dobie often spoke most fondly of his time playing ball in Patterson uh, at East Side Park in town. Uh, Patterson, New Jersey also has um, the Ward Street Post Office in town is named for him. Uh, and at the unveiling, uh, the mayor said that Dobie is a local hero. He is an American hero. In 2012, uh, the uh, United States Postal Service issued a series of Major League Baseball All-Stars on stamps. Um, Ted Williams, Willie Stargell, Joe DiMaggio, and Dobie. Um, uh, there was also a recent release uh, of, of the Congressional Gold Medal um, proposed in 2018. Uh, this was what you see here was released by the Citizens Advisory Coinage Committee and a medal with Dobie on the front and Dobie hugging Gromek on the back, you see part of that here, um, will be available later this year. So what do we make of Dobie's baseball legacy? His star continues to rise uh, nearly two decades after his death in 2003. Uh, Dobie received the Congressional gold medal, he's been on a postage stamp, he's had multiple statues. It suggests that not just baseball, but uh, the country is giving just due to a player that it hasn't properly recognized. And even so, Dobie still remains an anonymous trailblazer in the sport. Now locally, Cleveland could make Larry Dobie Day an event rather than giving it a passing mention. And Major League Baseball could make sure that Cleveland is always in town on this date. In 2019, uh, when uh, we last had regular fan attendance, uh, Cleveland didn't play at home, uh, didn't play at all on, on June the uh, July the 5th, the day of Dobie's debut. They played on July the 4th and they played on July the 6th and didn't play on July the 5th at all. This is something that, that could be rectified. This year, uh, Cleveland will be playing on the road at Tampa Bay on what would otherwise be Larry Dobie Day. Now in 2007, Cleveland, uh, all Cleveland players had worn Dobie's number 14 uh, when, they, when they took the field, much as the way players wear number 42 league-wide for Jackie Robinson, but it hasn't been applied um, consistently. Now some people ask whether it's appropriate for Larry Dobie's number to be retired across baseball, much the way that Jackie Robinson does. My suspicion is that that won't happen. Uh, Jackie Robinson's number being retired is a singular honor. Um, some people have suggested that, that it be afforded to Dobie, also to Roberto Clemente um, uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, my suspicion is that it will remain Jackie Robinson's number exclusively that is retired because of his uh, status as being first. 
But baseball could find some other way to honor Dobie. Perhaps it could be uh, something as simple as a, a patch that's always on the team's uniform bearing the number 14. Another idea might be to do something at the, at the World Series um, in, in concert with uh, uh, Dobie's historic World Series photo. Uh, he does have an award named after him. The Larry Dobie Award is given to the best player who plays in Major League Baseball's Futures game each year, but very few people know that. Fans feel they know Jackie Robinson. He has an omnipresence in American life. Of course, they may have seen the movie 42, uh, which uh, uh, showed exactly what Robinson went through. And Jackie Robinson has an iconic place in the same orbit almost with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But I don't feel the sporting public feels that they know Dobie or know his story. And to that end, more events and programs could help bring Dobie's name to the forefront. After all, he has an important place in Cleveland sports history. It would be a great testament to someone whose reputation is above reproach and who deserves more attention as the years go on. With the 100th anniversary of Dobie's birth coming up in just two years, it would be an ideal opportunity for the Cleveland Indians and for Major League Baseball to make Larry Dobie a centerpiece after all this time. Like I said, perhaps give him a, a permanent patch on the team's uniform, but whatever they decide, it needs to be a fitting way to recall one of baseball's oft-forgotten pioneers and to get him out of the shadows once and for all. Thank you. Well, John, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and sharing your expertise with all of us. I tr We truly appreciate it. Um, and I know we have some questions coming in. Um, I had a couple questions, so I want people to have the opportunity to, to ask some more as well. Um, so one of the questions I had, you mentioned Bill Beck, and I, you know, some people may know the name um, or his history, but one thing that you know, maybe some people you know, may know is that he was a true showman and a master marketer. Um, why don't you think Bill Beck used Dobie's debut uh, to draw more attention to the team? Well, as I mentioned, Dobie, Dobie appeared without really any fanfare at all. And it seems like a tremendously odd thing, given that uh, he had, that, that Vec took every possible opportunity to market things that he could. And uh, Vec had thought about integrating baseball's National League uh, around 1942. And he had thought of um, uh, perhaps uh, bringing a player, uh, an African-American player uh, to the um uh, Philadelphia Phillies, and it didn't. And when he brought the idea up to the commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, um, Landis was very cool to the idea. He had been known as trying to keep uh, keep baseball's color line intact. By the time that Dobie came up, Landis was gone, and uh, they had a new commissioner, Happy Chandler, who was much more receptive to breaking baseball's color line. But there was also this problem of people didn't really know what was going to happen and how the, what the reception was. Rather than trying to introduce it as some sort of joyous moment, um, the, the feeling was that it needed to be done incrementally, uh, that, it, that, uh, that the color line needed, needed to be broken and then people kind of had to get used to the idea, which kind of runs counter to the idea of, pr of promoting it uh, ad infinitum. But there was no right way to do it. And it goes to, you know, when you see that Branch Rickey uh, brought brought Robinson through the system and sort of had a plan for progression and and Beck had kind of the opposite indicated that people were kind of experimenting and didn't know quite what the best way was uh, to break through the color line. But that said, uh, there are enough comments out there that um, indicate that Beck felt that he put Dobie in an unfair position, uh, both by throwing him in there and by making him take on a, a, a place in the field that he wasn't ready to adjust to, uh, that I think Beck ultimately regretted that. So based on that, your answer there, and then going back to some of the, the pictures that we saw where, you know, Dobie was signing the contract with Beck or them standing outside the, the batter's box, what kind of relationship did Dobie and, uh, and Bill Beck have? They had a very good one. Uh, and in fact, uh, Dobie often praised Bill Beck's character and said that he had nothing bad to say about the guy. And this became a bit of an issue because Beck let him go as Chicago White Sox manager, someone for whom Dobie had tremendous esteem. And Dobie said that he never really asked for a reason. And that at one point, um, Beck had said something to the effect of, uh, that he um, and uh, that after Dobie was was removed as manager of the Chicago White Sox, he said, 
uh, Lawrence, if we do discuss it, we'll just sit here uh, for hours and maybe we'll wind up crying. So we just shouldn't do it. And so Dobie never got a good answer and frankly didn't have a lot of closure on why he didn't um, have uh, any man, uh, on why he didn't um, remain in the managerial position. But he did say on multiple occasions that Vec was the same in private as he was in public. And he took an active role in trying to mentor um, Dobie through all of his trials. Um, and, and then you kind of springboards to, to the next part because you just brought up the, you know, him not really having a great shot at the managerial position. Um, I know that you said he didn't never really got an answer of why he was kind of passed up after that short stint of, you know, a half a season. Um, why don't you think he got another shot with a different team? Or And then, you know, if he did, what kind of manager do you, do you personally think he would have been? Uh, Doby, I think, would have been a... a you know, often you see with good players, it is difficult for them to relate uh, to players who don't have quite their ability. And I got the sense that Doby related very well to players, that particularly when he was a hitting coach or a first base coach, that he often was a confidant. Um, and there are many instances where, where players had such admiration for him. Uh, at, at multiple stops, by the way, he, um, uh, and, and this is also true in Chicago, there was a player on the roster named uh, Larry Johnson, but his full name was Larry Doby Johnson. He had been named for Larry Doby, and here he is winding up on the same team that Doby himself is managing. So Doby had a certain measure of respect. Uh, and there's also a problem when you're an interim manager that you may not just be thought of as managerial material. You know, the, the guy who was fired who led to Doby's opportunity was Bob Lemon, himself a Hall of Fame pitcher. You know, there may just have been an instance where this just wasn't a team that was very good. And he didn't really, you know, it would have been, um, and this is true, like Frank Robinson took over a, a poor 1975 Cleveland team and Doby took over a poor 1978 Chicago White Sox team. And it would have been nice to see them with, with some actual talent with which to work. But all indications are that Doby was eager to um, uh, uh, eager to work with players and had enough patience that he would have uh, succeeded as a, a major league manager had he been given more opportunity. Cool. Well, let's jump into some of the questions from our our participants. So, uh, first one is: Do you think Larry Doby would have gotten more recognition if he would have played in a major media market like Boston or New York? Um, or Chicago, it, you know, when he was at the height of his career. Yes, uh, and I think, I mean, part of it was that the center of baseball truly was in New York. The Yankees were winning the pennant almost every year. Of course, Boston, you know, in the time when Doby was there, wasn't winning at all, but it was still a, a media centerpiece, and people just knew those players. You know, part of the problem that Doby ran into was that Jackie Robinson was getting um, press in the African-American newspapers. And it's much more conceivable that if Doby had been in one of those major markets that he would have um, re received uh, similar attention. I'm not totally sure that he would have wanted to play in a bigger market uh, in his entire career, just given his personality uh, and that it gave him just being out of the media spotlight gave him a little more opportunity uh, to grow into things, which I think he needed. The next question, uh, did Doby ever express what his, what he felt his greatest baseball moment was? Uh, he said winning the 1948 World Series, and he said that rather unequivocally. Um, and he, Doby cared a great deal about being a member of a team and how that team worked together. And he said on many occasions that um, the players um, on the on that particular 1948 uh, Cleveland team worked very well together on the field. They had a problem, may have had problems off the field, uh, but it was a but it was a, a very um, it was it was absolutely the pinnacle of his career. Wow! So he had a, he had the pinnacle pretty early on in his professional career. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I guess so, but I, you know, his better seasons came after that too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, it's, I, I can't say for certain, but I have a pretty good sense that he would, uh, list a 52 or 54, uh, fairly high on that list. Yeah. Uh, next one is, can you comment on how like Eplin treated him in our team, uh, which was recently published about the 48 season? Um, you know, what, I, I don't know about that book, but you know, would love yeah, to know. Yeah, I'm not sure it. I know about that book either, so I'm not sure I can give you much okay. comment. Okay. Um, I, mean, I know what I know of it, but I don't know it. All right, definitely something to, to look into then. Um, let's see what else we got. So I know one of the questions that when we started talking about this, and you kind of briefly touched on it, if you had the ability to kind of just 
you know, figure out the right way to honor Larry Doby, what do you personally think should happen? Uh, I like my idea of, of putting a patch on the uniform because you see that sometimes you'll see it with um, team owners who have died or, you know, or people have it on temporarily. I mean, putting it on the uniform would be a very visible way to do things. And, you know, it really, it really could endure, you know, and, and, you know, when you retire a number, you do take it out of circulation. Uh, you know, we see only the number 42 only one day a year. I mean, obviously it's on the walls and all of that, but if you put it on the uniform every day, it will be highly visible. Um, I could see having a Larry Doby award at the World Series, um, you know, and we, we're seeing more and more of, of awards being renamed these days. You know, the, the most valuable player award had been named for Kennesaw Mountain Landis. They've decided to rename that. Um, and you could see something like there being a, an award for some kind of ach achievement in the in the World Series um, um, that that could they could connect with that because you know he you know he he had his famous photo in Game Four of the World Series fairly late and um, you know something that sort of um, connected to the winning of the World Series would be a I think rather apt too um, you know you you want it to be present but you don't want it to be um, overwhelming I guess and I think Dolby would have wanted it that way. Sure. And then the last question, unless someone else has someone else in the chat. So uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, he was second twice, right? Second to Jackie Robinson and then second to, to Frank Robinson. And clearly, and, you know, you, sh you shared how he and Jackie were friends and had a, an admiration for each other. What was the relationship between Larry Doby and, and Frank Robinson like? Collegial. Um, and I don't think that, that he had any animosity toward Frank Robinson. Um, uh, I don't I get the sense that it was especially close, uh, but at the same time, um, they did work together. And, and the impression I get is that the, the, relation, the working relationship was very good. One thing about Doby is that even when people treated him poorly, he never seemed to have any animus toward them. You know, I mentioned that he didn't um, retaliate against people who, who treated him poorly. He always said that he always felt if he wasn't wanted, he kind of went somewhere else. And, uh, and he, you know, his career in some ways is a testament to always going on to the next thing. I mean, the way he kind of reinvented himself, you know, I mentioned how he went from, you know, she didn't get the job in Chicago. He goes on and, and goes to the NBA and then goes on to be a team executive and to a degree kept himself in Major League Baseball for more than half a century, which is pretty remarkable. And so Dobie has a constant sense of reinvention without necessarily ever really giving a hint of bitterness in the midst of all of this, which is remarkable. Well, John, thank you so much for being with us this evening and sharing your expertise and passion for our national pastime. Uh, it has been wonderful to have you as part of our alumni continued education series. Uh, and not only that, but we're incredibly fortunate to have you within the John Carroll community in educating our students. So. Thank you again for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thanks to you for listening. Thank you all for, uh, for being here tonight. Uh, you can find more information about and register for all of our programs, uh, including our alumni author series, scholarly lunches, our alumni content education series, our alumni spotlight events, and our JCU junior programs at jcu.edu backslash alumni. Additionally, we invite you to uh, view recordings on all of our previous programs on our JCU Alumni Association YouTube channel. To view our extensive, extensive library, search John Carroll University Alumni on YouTube. Finally, please consider, consider a charitable gift to uh, John Carroll in support of our students, our outstanding faculty, and our entire campus community. If you've already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. If you have not done so, please join me in making a gift and so we can continue to deliver an outstanding education for our current and future blue streaks. You can make, make a donation by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Take care, be well, stay safe, and onward on John Carroll.